and we dunk it into the sink. Not too long ago, I was out on the town at the stadium watching a hockey game as any proud Canadian would dare, bud. And I had kind of a strange experience. I was sitting there swiping my phone, looking at memes, and I went, man, this Wi-Fi is actually really good. So I opened speed test and I ran a speed test and I was like, how am I getting 400 megabit in a stadium with thousands of people? Where even is the Wi-Fi? How does this even work? The answer is this. Well, maybe not exactly this, but something like this. This, my friends, is the Ubiquiti E7 audience. Their absolute fucking top of the line access point. This thing right here, I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, I'm breaking my rule, cost 2,000 US dollars. $2,000, holy shit. That's a lot of money, and <laughs> today we're gonna find out if that is justified. Now this kind of Wi-Fi is not something you buy for your nan or your house. And as the name implies, it's built for powering Wi-Fi for a large, large audience. I mean, just look at the thing. It's beyond the size of my head. It's like three of my heads. Doo -doo -doo. On the back here, we've got the mounting situation, which is just this handy dandy little bracket thing. Gets hooked on something like that. Now it's mounted and you can adjust the angle up and down. It doesn't have uh, like a pan feature, just tilt. It's really meant to go on like a pole. So you would just sandwich the pole either like horizontally or vertically, kind of like my fingers are right there. It does also come with these like giant drywall anchor things because the other main application for something like this would be say a school, like a university or a high school, somewhere where you have a lot of people in one big space. On the bottom here, we have not one, but two cable glands. <laughs> I kind of hate that they're called that, but these are used to insulate your wire. So you just stick your ethernet cable through this thing and then tighten down the top, which squishes the little rubber insert. That way you don't get any water leaking into your access point, even though it's on the bottom. That's what gives this its IP68 rating, which is kind of a ridiculous rating for an access point. It means it's fully dust tight and can handle submersion. Like in a tank of water. Speed test running. And we dunk it into the sink. Speed test still running. Oh, sorry, it's not. There we go. Now it's submerged. Still works. The signal is a lot worse. What if I just, just does it? Oh yeah. Oh, it got better. It, it legitimately, the speed went up. Why do they let me have things like this? <laughs> which is crazy, up to one meter for like an extended period of time. They also rate this thing for 1500 plus clients connected to it, which is a ridiculous number, and why it has a 10 gigabit input, a PoE++ one to be exact, and it also has a PoE++ one gigabit port for high availability. So if this cable gets cut, or the switch has a problem or whatever, the AP will automatically switch over to this port without having to do any fancy LACP, it's really integrated into the device itself. There's also a screen on the bottom. I don't really know why, I guess it's just cause you can at that point. I don't know how you would read it if it was mounted to like the jumbotron. But aside from the reset button over here and the LED ring that goes around the whole thing, that's basically all there is on the outside. I guess what's left other than to plug the bloody thing in and see how she goes. Now luckily the switch behind me on my little set here is a Pro XG10 and it does do 10 gigabit PoE++++, which is even crazier, 90 watts. It's not even a standard that really exists, but Ubiquity likes to think it does. And that's fine by me. You know what I'm not a fan of though? My personal information just floating around the internet for any scammer, script kitty, or weirdo to find. Well, it's not something I used to take as seriously with today's AI easily capable of faking your voice on the phone or your face in a video call. Having things like your phone number, your name, or your address out there, it's just a whole new level of danger. That's where Incogni, who sponsored this portion of today's video, can help. Incogni works by tracking and removing your personally identifiable information from the internet by going after the data data brokers and people search sites that could be selling your info without you even knowing. Getting set up is super easy and within a day, the spam calls I was constantly getting almost entirely stopped. It just gives me incredible peace of mind knowing how much harder it is for a scammer to do anything bad if they can't find you in the first place. Plus, with their unlimited plan, if you find your data on a site they don't already cover, you can just copy paste the link into Incogni and their team takes care of the rest. So take your personal data back with Incogni by using code JAKU for 60% off at incogni.com slash jacku or by using the link down in the description. 
Hey, look at that. Now, if you're interested in checking this thing out because you're insane or you happen to be an IT admin for a school or maybe you are an IT admin for a stadium, honestly, the reason they built this thing is actually because the CEO of Ubiquity happens to own the Memphis Grizzlies, which used to be the Vancouver Grizzlies, our home team that they, they stole from us. I'm just kidding, I'm sure they went willingly, but this access point is used in that stadium. So I haven't been, but I'm sure their Wi-Fi is sick. Look at that, it's ready for adoption. Just like my Patreon is ready for adoption. That way you can support the channel directly. Pretty cool, right? But if you can't do that, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, leave a comment, let me know what you think about this thing because I think it's crazy. And while that does its thing, we can talk about what makes this thing worthy of the tooth thousand US dollar price tag because there's some very cool technology in here. First and foremost is that it doesn't support 2.4 gigahertz, which you'd be like, but what? This thing is bullin'. Why doesn't it support 2.4 gigahertz? The answer is so that it can support faster shit. Now, just like a normal Wi-Fi 7 access point, it does have three bands. They're just different bands. So instead of having that 2.4 gigahertz, you have a five gigahertz to start and then dual six gigahertz. So it's kind of like having two or three access points in one. And all three of those radios can do four by four MIMO, which means this thing has 12 spatial streams. Kind of ridiculous. It's like having 12 devices being able to talk to this thing at the same time, which sounds like not that much, but in Wi-Fi speak, that's a lot of communication. Usually your Wi-Fi access point only can handle a couple, maybe four or six or eight devices at the same time. And what's even cooler is that it actually has two sets of antennas that you can switch between in software. And you're like, antennas, well, what does that mean? My Wi-Fi access point has like eight antennas. It looks like a spider. No, the antennas are inside of here and they have very specific directionality to them. They're not like a normal like dish Wi-Fi access point that Ubiquity makes that just kind of has a very broad kind of wide pattern. This gives you the option to transmit either in a 90 by 90 degree pattern, which is the wide mode or you can transmit in a like a high power long range mode that's only 50 by 50. Either way, it does support AFC on both of the six gigahertz antennas in this outdoor variant here, which means it can transmit at 36 dBm EIRP, which is, you know, the effective power that's very high. On top of that, because this is such a crazy access point, the AP right now with nobody connected to it is drawing 26 watts. That's a lot of Wi-Fi juice. All of that is to say, there is no way that I can put any meaningful load on this access point in my house by myself. But I have a better idea. By getting on an airplane and flying halfway across the continent to Colorado of all places? Well, because I want to go to Casa Bonita, obviously. It's like the Disneyland of Mexican restaurants. But also because this giant cavernous space behind me is soon to be housing 300 unsuspecting victims. There's going to be a land party in here tomorrow. And I happen to be buddies with the chapter admin here at Landfest Colorado. So we're going to be able to test this U6 enterprise in a, a real world situation, a real world situation that should very well push it to its limits. This space is around 250 by 150 feet and we're gonna do it with one access point. Now they've been doing this land for a number of years, so the setup process and everything is very streamlined. It's honestly kind of impressive. They've got custom fiber reels to run the networking to each of the individual rows, and then on the rows, they have custom ethernet, like which is basically just a bunch of ethernet cables zip tied together um, to give ethernet to each seat. So you don't actually even have to bring your own network cable. However, they don't usually have a crazy Wi-Fi access point that needs 50 watts of power. So to fill that role, I've got this guy. It's the new Pro XG8 PoE. It's a eight port 10 gig PoE plus plus. And then it also has two little SFP plus 10 gig ports as well. All in this tiny little package. It's so cute. Now since we're trying to do this entire ginormous space with one access point, where we position it is actually pretty important. Now I talked to Tom over at Ubiquity and I asked him like, oh, is, is one AP enough for this room? And he just responded with a screenshot from Unified Design Center and LOL. So I don't think the coverage is gonna be a problem, but we do kind of need to position it in the middle of the room about 20 or 30 feet up. That basically leaves us with mounting it on this like weird cross brace thing. I just realized an enormous problem. It only goes horizontal or vertical. You can't mount it on a piece that's going 45 degrees. Otherwise the AP is gonna be like, which we don't want. See, I found this pipe. How am I gonna attach that pipe? Zip ties. Oh, these zip ties suck ass. 
And just for safety, I'm gonna wrap a bunch of yellow duct tape so nobody can see the mess I've made. I think this will be good for the Wi-Fi. We'll just bounce it off the floor. Moment of truth. Look at that, it lit up. I forgot that this thing had RGB, so we have to set the color. That's very important. Whoa, there's so many different settings than there usually is. Uh, let's go with like a very deep blue, maybe. I'm gonna just send it on a 320 wide. <laughs> 320 wide, 160 wide. You can do a 240 wide, five gigahertz, what? No, we'll do, we'll do 165 gigahertz. Why not, right? Oh yeah, also we want wide angle, low gain. When we were doing these simulations online in the Unified Design Center, it seemed like the wide angle, low gain would cover this entire space uh, in good signal. We'll see what happens. Let's go with the complete other end of the building. If it works over here at like anything more than like 300 megabit, dude, we're mission accomplished. So this is the camera and we are 200 feet away. <laughs> the download speed, 500 down, 600 down. Fast forward to now and we have basically the entire venue filled up. You can see all of those freaking gamers over there, wow. Now most of the systems in here are hardwired. That's why we don't have 500 people on the access point, which is all the way over there. But we've got a lot of people's phones and we've definitely got some laptops. Looking at the traffic graph, I mean, there's been times where we've been at a gigabit plus consistently and the overall traffic over the last two days has been over a terabyte off of that AP. So the question remains, how has the experience been, right? Well, in talking to Kevin and the other admins, we've had basically zero complaints about Wi-Fi. There was one dude that was complaining we don't have 2.4 gigahertz, so we had to set up another AP that just does 2.4 gigahertz. But other than that, it's been rock solid the entire time and extremely usable. For the people that have six gigahertz capable devices, here, let's, let me run a speed test right now. I'm getting over a gigabit off of my laptop 200 feet away. Now, something that's kind of interesting about how these radios get used, if we look in the unified dashboard here, you'll see that the low band six gigahertz, which is like the, the first six gigahertz radio, is set up to only use channels in the low band of the six gigahertz spectrum. That one seems to get used way more than the high band, which as you can probably imagine, is locked to, what the, whoa, there's lights on, that's crazy, which is locked to the higher half or so of the six gigahertz frequency doesn't get used nearly as much. Now I'm pretty sure this is because the low band is set to 320 megahertz and the high band is only set to 160. Those are the max for each of them. And the devices are going, oh, I got a wider channel on the low band, I'll just use that. And the AP doesn't really have the ability to tell them to roam between them. All it can really do is say, hey, this one's used more and this one's used less. I did try setting the low band to 160 megahertz, so it matched and it did seem like they were kind of more evenly distributed. It's ridiculous, like 800 megabit. Astonished. <laughs> We're into the second day of this event with no Wi-Fi issues off of one AP in a 200 by 150 foot room. We do have line of sight on pretty much everything. It's an open space. Obviously, if you had like a house with a bunch of rooms and stuff, it would be nowhere near as good. But for this use case, with our audience, it seems like the E7 audience is an absolute banger. So I don't know really what else there is to say. I am absolutely flabbergasted. I think I'm going to donate that E7 audience to Landfest so that they can use it at this event because it worked that well. And honestly, what am I going to do with it? The folks that run this event, Landfest, it's a charity land party and they run them all over the country to raise money for different charities depending on where you're at. Every time they run an event, they pick a different charity. But I think last year was the Boys and Growth Club nearby, which is pretty cool. So check out my Patreon at the link down below if you want to support the channel. Leave a comment. Let me know. What do you think about the E7 audience, kind of crazy. Have you played with directional Wi-Fi? Hit the like button, get subscribed, goodbye.